Good morning. We saw the Brumbies game yesterday. Nobody. Nobody here watches rugby. Any rugby supporters here? What my friend over here is doing is just um, putting up a little sign which is it says John 3.16. It's a, a part from the Bible which uh, just talks about God's love for us. And uh, I don't know if you've seen that at uh, rugby games and golf games and virtually any kind of sport you can imagine. There's always some sign in the crowd that holds up a sign saying John 3.16. And uh, this song is uh, a bit of a tribute to those brave band of men and women out there, out there in the stands, risking life with their men. This is a tribute to them. Oh, 
Hosanna Fellowship. And a special welcome to this morning to our visitors here. Today's topic of the special event is excuse me. The topic of this special event this morning.
<laughs> a young man. What is this? It's a magazine. <laughs> what kind? It's a Playboy. What's it doing under my cushion? Hiding from you. <laughs> I don't believe this. Sorry, Mum. Why? For the articles. The lack of articles of clothing on these girls. I mean, oh, look at this. This is just flesh and bones. They're not even real. Oh, no, you're not going. I have not finished with you yet. You are going to burn for this, young oh, man. Um, what were you thinking? Well, I don't want to know what you were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> this is degrading to women. Women as a whole. What are you going to be thinking next time you see a beautiful woman walking down the street? The same thing I always do. This is a disgrace to the hard-working, respectable, honest woman of this community. Jack, next time I walk into a room, are you going to be undressing me with your eyes? Well, you can't stop it. You're making me sick.
just question yourself. Are we presenting ourselves as a suitable role model for the younger generations, for our peers? Do we, do we live what we talk? Okay, let's stand. Everybody stand and let's welcome on the congregational team. Thank you. Sure, come in. I'm just having a late night snack. Um, yeah, do you want something? A, a sandwich? A Coke, maybe? Well, there's not really much to a sandwich. I mean, how about it? No, oh, just So, well, what's going on? Uh, does your mother know you're here? Do you want Well, I think it would be a good idea to tell her. Yeah, that would be a good slap in the face. 
Hello, hello, Mum. I'm moving on with Dad because you're driving me crazy. Is that why you're here, Zach? To move on? on. <coughs> well, I'd like to discuss it. Get it. Hey, wait, Zach. Is it a problem? Well, the problem is I haven't seen you or your earring for a couple of months. And I seem to recall the last time we spoke, you told me where I could go. Not exactly a good premise with which to welcome you into my apartment. Premise? Apartment? What is that? I thought I was your kid, not some business partner. Sorry, Zach. Things aren't coming out how I mean. Look, it's good to see you, earring and all. Earring yeah. stakes. <coughs> okay, okay. Well, come on, let's, let's sit down. So, what's going on? Mum kicked me out. Why did she kick you out, Zach? Because she walked in on me and Krista in my bedroom. In my bed. Who's Krista? Hey, look, can we just cut the sarcasm for once and have a normal conversation? Normal? Normal? What is that? I haven't known normal my whole life! What were you doing with a girl in your room? Gee. Hey, look, you know the rules, Zach. No girls in the room. Is everything all right? All right, Um, yeah. Susan, um, this is my son, Zach. Nice to meet you, Zach. This is my house, Zach. Oh, I see, and now the rules are different? Yeah, you seem to be forgetting that I am your father. So is this the bit where you give me a speech about the same sex, or did you just want to grow a kind of little twerp? Go ahead! Go ahead! <laughs> Look, I'm sorry you had to find out about Susan like this. I knew about this a long time ago, even before the divorce. What do you mean you knew? I used to listen to your phone calls. <laughs> I did, I'm not like Mum. I didn't buy it. Then you got business calls at night. I was getting business calls at night. Oh, come on, Dad. I saw you coming out of Valentine's arm in arm with her. You were all over her. You never touched Mum like that. Look, Zach, it's a, it's a long story, but if you really want me to tell you, I will. Oh, Dad, I really don't want to hear! I don't know! I don't know what I want! So, how's school? I thought we decided we were going to go to Varsity. Yeah, well, I decided university wasn't worth it. Look where your horticulture degree got you. So hey, insurance? It hasn't been a bad career. It bought us a house, it paid for vacations, it paid for a boat, it paid for your car. And it'll pay for Varsity if you want it to. Dad, it did buy us a lot. We don't have much. Thank <laughs> you.
two of the Aphrodite died them, but the Amphase them, and are destroyed by the Egyptianity. I know, my God, <coughs> that you test the heart and are pleased for integrity. And in my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Now let's welcome on the dance team. Hang my head and cry. Now it's interesting. If we lose it, everyone knows. If we keep it, it's considered a miracle. But one slip up, in the midst of keeping it, we're done for. That's what integrity's like. And I remember, as a young boy, being deeply impressed by people with integrity, although at the time I had never heard of the word. Somehow I knew 
that something different was actually happening here. Here was somebody that had something that I liked. Something that seemed to hold them above others. You know, for every one of us, there's a measure of integrity built into our lives. But it's what we do that will make or break who we are. One of the things about people with integrity, it's often said of them, that they're people with real moral fibre. I never understood what that meant when I was younger. Something like flax fibre or something, I'm not sure. But I, I know that the people with the highest integrity are the ones who could deal with issues better than others. And it was obvious. There are people who handle stress differently. There are people who don't let others control them and they don't get out of control with others. They are not empty of issues. They just deal with issues differently. They'll struggle through them and they'll seek the best for others. They won't be popular with some people at times, but they will sometimes be at least grudgingly and maybe even highly respected by others. That's what integrity is like. And this morning, as we start, I'd like to look at a definition <coughs> of integrity. What is it? The quality or state of being complete going to get this thing in the right place. The quality or state of being complete with sound moral principle, uprightness, honesty and sincerity. You here has all of that. Put your hand up. Mm, interesting, isn't it? The church this morning indeed is full of hypocrites. Would that be right? You are terribly, terribly silent. You are terribly, terribly silent. Think about this. The quality or state of being complete with sound moral principle, uprightness, honesty, and sincerity. There's a little boy's version of the Old Testament when he's asked about what the Old Testament uh, said about lying. He said this. He said, a lie is an abomination unto the Lord, and a very present help in trouble. Did you get it? You are nervous this morning. I sense there's a nervousness, and you're not a... You know, this little guy had mixed the two concepts up, and he'd stuck them together, and he realized the real meaning of life. Obviously for his parents and maybe others around him. See, one of the things that, that we don't always recognize with integrity is that we live a lie if we say we are good or that we say we are maybe even a Christian. But we live this lie. You see, lie, a lie or lying is the key destroyer of integrity. It eats away your moral fiber like a worm that gets inside you and comes away. You know, I remember my friend years ago who bit into a pie at school. We bought these pies at the, at the tuck shop. And this guy always had lots of money and he's one of those guys who just everything seemed to get dished to him on a plate. And he bit into this pie and I always remember feeling some pleasure when he went, Ugh! As he went to take a second bite, he looked at the pie, which you usually do on your second bite, only to discover the whole pie was absolutely chock-a-block full of wriggling maggots. He showed it to us. I always remember thinking some delight upon that boy. 
He always had things we never had, and I thought justice was done at last. <laughs> and I sat there, and that night I had this dream. I had this dream of this boy eating this pie, and all these maggots were alive, and I didn't know that maggots didn't attack live flesh, so I saw him being eaten from inside out, and it gave me good pleasure. Why was it that I felt that way? Now, I wasn't a Christian, in case some of you jump on me. I thought it was pretty good thought, actually. I thought the guy deserved to be eaten from inside out because he was a person who lacked an incredible amount of integrity. You see, one of the things I knew that some of the other boys didn't know is he, he used to steal a lot of his money. But he was the boy in front of the teachers who could always smile and say the right things and get the best place. And the teacher was totally innocent to the fact that they were reinforcing this guy's lacks rather than his strengths. Now I can understand why they did. I'm not blaming the teacher. They just didn't know. But some of us knew. You see, a lack of integrity is like that. Sometimes we can, it can be things that are inside us that are, that are creeping around and eating us away. To say we believe one thing and to do another is quite an atrocious thing. We've been using this thing lots outside, discovering that some of the things aren't quite where they were meant to be. And should have had some panelling up on our building this week, but uh, due to the fact that some things weren't where they were meant to be and some other things were missing altogether, and, due to the fact that the architect had done one concept drawing and the engineer had done quite a different detail, created a problem for us and we couldn't get up. And, and, and I got up there and I had to get this level to work hard. We put a piece of aluminium on the top of the steel framing and we squared this thing up. And I know that at the end of the day, when we put the panel on, that thing will be square and true. But I also know by the time I get to the bottom in some places that it's not quite square and true. And there's no fiddling around that's going to change it because the steel stuck in concrete, bolted below the concrete, three foot below the concrete, and block walls all up around it, and one of the poles is 16 millimetre out. And Bruce and my, myself have looked, have looked at that and shaken our heads and said, well, they told us it was in the wrong place, so they moved it. And now it's worse. And we've delighted in telling Ralph and others, you know, we had it in the right place before, but it's not now. You know, that's like our lives. We, we kind of uh, want to be able to have the balance and the level, you know? And, uh, you know, we, we try our best. Well, we say we do. We actually deceive ourselves in thinking we're trying our best sometimes. Uh, you can't say the level's crook. It's not. Because you turn it one side and you turn it the other. It still shows the same marking. Easy to check the level. It's easy to check our lives. And so this morning, we need to ask ourselves this question. <coughs> that didn't do our level much good. Where do we stand? See, in terms of integrity, the things like attitudes, honesty, respect, consideration to others, openness to, to, to other people, humility, and care for each other. These are the things, are, are part of the whole deal that builds up for this whole thing of integrity. So where do I stand? And we need to not just ask generally where, I, where do I stand because most of us will say, well, I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. Uh, too bad that nobody else got the opportunity to tell you. Uh, is that what it is? Work, sport, home, wherever we are. I wonder this morning, you know, this is a Playboy drama. I thought it was excellent, didn't you? Yeah, yeah let's give him another hand. Come on. Yeah. You guys have wrote that script an excellent job. You know, a real slice of life. But I was thinking as I was sitting there, because I, I was already aware of this Playboy magazine coming into the church, and uh, I saw our, our, our backstage people, they get some strange jobs sometimes, you know? <laughs> Um, um, Denise Ramsey, she was in the office before the service. She had the guts out of the Playboy magazine. They'd taken the original middle out and they'd put another one in, just so that our poor 
young boy wasn't going to get exposed to this sort of stuff. And, uh, and, and she was tearing it up so nobody else could see it. <laughs> right? Uh, she was trying to make sure she kept integrity and trying to help the guys keep their integrity, probably protecting their little souls and uh, you know, pretty messed up sometimes in any case by the world. But, but we know, don't we? No? That, that drama had us sitting there because it was so slice of life. It was real. It was very real. But I sat there with another thought. You see, this is the past I'm thinking. I'm sitting there thinking, well, I think Derek went and bought it. Mm. <laughs> what a problem for old Derek. I wonder how he bought it. Did he go to the shopkeeper and say to the shopkeeper, I'm only buying this for the church. <laughs> <laughs> problem. I'm sure the shopkeeper was quite amazed by that kind of thought, if he said that. I'm not sure what Derek said. I should have asked him before I came. But, but can you imagine the problem that he's, uh, <laughs> he was facing? Well, he could always go back to the, the shopkeeper and say, we made good use of your plate, boy. You won't get so many sales on them anymore. <laughs> that would be a good conclusion, I think. But I sat there and I thought, and I thought back in my own life, and, it wasn't that long ago while I've been a pastor that I had an experience that I won't forget and I don't want to ever visit again. I had a friend, another pastor who's, who's uh, part of our network of churches in New Zealand, which we've got quite a few of them. And, and uh, he said, he rang me up and he said, you got my gear, some gear sorted out. And I said, yeah, oh, yeah, I've got it sorted out. But the only trouble was that I knew he was asking if I had sorted it out with Auckland and I was telling him I'd sorted it out here. And I knew, and I struggled with it for the next few hours, I really struggled with it because I couldn't bring him at the time of night when I really got to the point of, of really being willing to face it. I had to wait till the next morning, I had a sleepless night, as I felt I needed to deal with it because this was a lack of integrity. That it, I knew what he was asking and although I'd answered a question I had not answered it honestly, really honestly. So I had to ring him in the morning. And I apologised to him and I said, look, bro, you were asking this. I, I'm sorry, but I, I was not totally honest with you. In fact, if I'm really honest, I, I lied to you. Oh, yeah, it was very subtle, but it was a lie nonetheless. And I feel real bad about it. I just want to confess to you. And I, I want to, to apologise. Well, God wasn't finished with me because I came to church in the morning. I was preaching on a subject I was already preaching on. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. It was right on the nail. I can't remember the heading, but I remember what I felt. I went through this immense struggle. And in the end, I decided I, to keep my integrity. I needed to stand up before this church here and say to them, I'm sorry, I blew it. I let you down. I have sinned. And that wasn't an easy thing. And I said to the church, I would understand if you don't want me as your pastor anymore. Uh, and I stand here with this thing. And I, I confessed to God. I put it right to God. I confessed it to my friend, the pastor. But I needed to confess it to you because I feel as if in some senses I owe it to you. And that, that was hard. It was very hard. And we need to ask ourselves, where do we stand? You see, where do we stand at work? Are we honest with the way we use our time? Because if we're not using the time for the boss in the right way, then we are lacking integrity. If we deceive or lie in even the smallest degree, we are lacking integrity. If we even take home a work pen, without permission to do so, without the knowledge that the firm is okay about that, then we are lacking integrity. If we get on the bus <coughs> and the bus driver says, oops, you've given me too much, you're only a half there. And you just accept it and get on the bus in any case. Now some of you look too old to get away with that. But my wife, when she was in her 20s, could get on a bus and the drivers wouldn't want to accept a full fear from her. They would only want to accept the half fear because she looks so young. And she still looks pretty young like me. 
But she, uh, she no longer gets away with that. They no longer offer the chance. But the decision she had to make at that point is, do I pay a full fare, or do I just graciously get on the bus and say thank you? <laughs> See, every one of us would want to get on the bus and say thank you, because we just saved ourselves 60 cents, or whatever it is. But the real thing was, and Pauline, I've got to tell you, she said, no, I'm full fare. No, I am full fear. Now, I'm not sure she did that every time, um, but I know of one situation where she did. The thing is, what do we do when we play and how we play in sport? I don't know why we call it sport. We should call it gladiators. And we should call it extreme gladiators for rugby. Ultimate extreme gladiators for league. Mild gladiators for soccer. <laughs> gladiators discreet with netball. But they should be all gladiators because sport is meant to be something where we don't go out to kill each other. But we do it too easily. I remember one of the things I found hardest to learn when I was playing badminton and I was top seating out. Uh, in Christchurch see, years ago and, uh, and I had a young woman who was older than me in actual fact. She came to play and she's one of those ones who would go and hit the shuttle cop she'd go <clears throat> like this and the thing would fall behind her just at every shot. And uh, at first I enjoyed killing her. <laughs> then I felt guilty killing her. And eventually I decided I don't want to see her killed anymore. I don't mean literally killing her. I mean on the court doing it. Smashing the shuttlecock. I remember the times when I first came here and Craig Russell came to the church and Craig, I found out, had these cuts and awards for Wellington region for his badminton skills. Now, I used to tease him and say, I'm going to thrash the hide off you one day when he came along to our club that I joined here. And I didn't know it was his club that he used to belong to. I got along there to discover some of the people there. He told me just terrific stories about what he used to be like and I'm so glad he changed. And uh, then he came this night and he got on the court and he had absolutely no mercy for me. <laughs> None. He, he, I got five points. He played with me like a mouse. He was a cat, I was a mouse. I hadn't played for a few years, and he, they had different ways of playing from where I used to play, quite different sort of sneaky, dirty little things that they did. <laughs> well, that's the way I felt about it. Really was quite fair play. But he was going to kill me. Now, I remember a few weeks later, we were along at the club there, and Craig used to come along here, dress up all disarmingly, he didn't have the regulation clothing on as usual. <laughs> and uh, he had his sand shoes on, but his laces were undone and trailing behind his feet, and they were long laces. And there's these two Māori boys that we'd become quite friendly with, they were sitting on the side of the court, and this other guy from another club had come along because their club had collapsed. And Craig got on the court and this guy looked at Craig and you could see him look him up and down, feet to the head. He didn't know Craig. And uh, Craig, oh, can I have a game? Huh? Talk about sucking a guy in. <laughs> and the guy says, you could see the glint in his eyes. He looked at Craig up and down, oh, I'm going to kill this guy. So they get on the court and, uh, and Craig goes out and the guy hits it over the side of the court. Craig goes, this. And he played this guy up and you could see this guy and in the end this guy said to him, you like a game? Oh, I, I, yeah, I could play a game with you. And you could see the, the, the anticipation, he was drooling, ready to kill Craig. Well at that point Craig started playing. The guy only got three points. Good player. The thing is, that guy got beaten by his own lack of integrity, his own respect for others. Now, 
Craig did me in as well, but never mind. That was fun. That's what he thought. I was done in afterwards. But most of us, most of us do things that are going to be destructive. Most people live for today and they couldn't give a hoot about tomorrow. Except if they can get more money so they can do more tomorrow. At the end of the day, there's a lack of integrity in that. You know, one of the most amazing things about the whole sport thing and about our, our, our lifestyle in New Zealand, that aggression is hailed as being excellent. Nasty aggression is hailed as being excellent. And when people get sinned off the field, people sit there and chuckle and say, ha ha ha, you know. Well, it doesn't make me feel like that. You know, I support Canterbury, and they're a very good team. Uh, it's got some supporters here. But if they, if they start playing dirty, I will always go and support the other side. Because I don't think in any way aggression should be hailed. In actual fact, long term, even in the sporting world, it's not. Who are the ones who get the highest honours after years of being in sport? You can think of their names. One of the latest men, Iceman, they called him. Jones. Now he did some bad things in his days on other occasions, but he was respected and one of the things that was said when he was given this award by some of the people that did a kind of a this is your life thing was that he was a man of integrity. I thought what an amazing accolade to be given because there are other guys who played the sport for years, other guys who probably played in lots of ways just as skillfully as Michael Jones. But there was something about Michael on the field and off the field that everybody respected. It was his integrity. And it wasn't just because he was a Christian. I think he had integrity because he was a Christian. But he wasn't respected just because he was a Christian. What we do with our money, how much time we spend with our family, whether we're willing to to say one thing and do another, like our guy here today, Dad. No girlfriends in the bedroom, but yeah, sure. Huh? Well, don't you swear in this house, you... I, I, it used to puzzle me as a young man, I guess I didn't realise in those days I was a rationalist, but it used to puzzle me how parents could, could tell their children not to swear and in the process swear themselves just doesn't tie up. It's lacking integrity. How we handle personal conflict, whether we obey the law or not. As some of you I understand have probably got faulty speedos. <laughs> Don't guess at it whether it's faulty. Go and get it checked out if you're not really sure. Then you'll be absolutely certain if you're speeding or not or whatever. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't tell me that your right leg's heavier than your left leg and that's the reason why you speed, as a friend of mine used to do. Whether we obey the law or not is a matter of integrity. What we do in our life, how we handle our mistakes and our misdeeds. You see, sometimes we make mistakes and we didn't intend to be seen as wrong, but we are seen as wrong. How we handle, that's the issue. And how we handle the things that we do do wrong with intention. Whether we can compromise ourselves in some way. There's an old Russian parable. In this old Russian parable, there's a hunter who is lying his gun up on a bear and he's about to pull the trigger when the bear, who could amazingly talk. And he said in a very soothing voice, look, uh, uh, I, uh, I don't want, I don't want to be shot. And the hunter said, well, I want a fur coat. And the bear said, but I want a full stomach. He said, how about, in the very soothing times, how about we sit down and we come to some compromise. After a while, the bear walked off alone. He 
See, the hunter had compromised. He had his fur coat, and the bear had his full stomach. You know, that's what compromise is all about sometimes. Sometimes when we compromise, we can only expect a bad ending. There are things that mark us for who we are. White lies, are they all right or are they not? Can I suggest to you that a white lie is a lack of integrity? <coughs> if you are being a little bit of a white lie, and, and really that story I told you about with my friend, with my pastor earlier, where I wasn't totally honest with him, it was a white lie because really I was telling the truth, but I knew that he wasn't asking for that, that same question. I was telling the truth to the question that I was imagining he asked or making me believe he asked. When I really knew deep down that he really wanted to know whether he's going to get his gear in the next couple of days. The white lie. I want to tell you something. The bad thing about white lies is that they're harder to see. But they are just as destructive as black ones. Secret wrongs are secret wrongs. You can't ch change it. A wrong is a wrong. You cannot make a wrong a right by fiddling with it. So we come to this last point here this morning. I want to state this morning that integrity is the basis for life and eternity. Many people say they believe God, believe in God, and they feel comfortable about just living the way they do. Or there's others that go to church. But those that around them see little change, they see little difference, they see nothing really happening. They're just going to church. It's kind of like trying to get a free ticket to the movies by sitting in the foyer. Both people are in trouble in terms of integrity. See, if we say we believe in God, and we still feel comfortable with the way that we're living or doing things, then I'd want to say to you really straight up that that's rubbish. If you believe in God, you have to believe in what He says and you have to do what He asks. Intellectual assent is nothing. It's valueless. It's like this. There's an old story. It tells of a desert nomad. He awakened in the middle of the night feeling hungry. And so he lit a candle in his tent. And he reached over to eat some of his dates. And in the light of the candles, he went to eat the date. He noticed a worm in it. So he threw it out the tent window. Of the door, rather. I don't have to put He threw it out the door of the tent. And he picked up another date. And the same thing. So he threw it out the door of the tent. And he got halfway through his dates. And he's still getting worms. So you know what he did? He blew out his candle and ate the rest of the dates. Ugh, I can see the worms inside. <laughs> but see, lots of us are like that. We prefer to live in darkness rather than live in the light, where, we, where things can be seen. We would believe things that we've heard other people say. We believe things that teachings or ideas that other people might have without really thoroughly and absolutely checking it out and making sure that the thing is real. We can get taken in by others' lack of integrity when in actual fact we need to keep our own integrity in the way that we pursue our lives. Amen? How we care, how we live, are important. Integrity at times will cost you. I know there are times in the past when I had a real problem. When I was at work, most of our department ended up sick of work. There was a lot of men working there. So they brought in the railway detectives to try and find out what was making us all sick. <coughs> I was one of the few survivors. In any case, what happened, I went to the toilet. He was one of our cleaners. 
He's cleaning the uranium with a brush. Handbrush. As I walked out, he, he took this handbrush and he flicked it into a bucket and walked up ahead of me up the stairs. He went upstairs and he went over to all the cups and he picked them up in groups and stuck them out ready for all of us to drink. I had a real problem on my hands because I needed to do something about it. I thought about it seriously and I knew the guys were going to tell me that I was a potter. Now that's not the kind that makes pots. It's somebody who tells on somebody. And I, it, but it needed to happen. This guy had been several times warned that he wasn't to be involved with helping the guy in the cafeteria. So I went and I talked with the foreman and sure enough I got guys who decided that I was a potter. Some of them had been sick. Some of them had been the ones who had copped the results of this, his unhealthy habits. Can you imagine if one of the people who did their business in the urinal and had a particular disease that was particularly virulent, it could have killed. And at the time, I really struggled with it. I really struggled, but I knew that I had to, at the end of the day, had to be accountable to God and not just to what man thought. I knew that it was a tough decision. I knew I might not be popular. I knew that by telling on him I could even suffer real serious stuff from some of the guys because they were prone to that kind of idiocy at times. I remember one occasion when I had suffered very badly and I thought about that at the time. By the end of the day, doing the right thing was more important than my safety. Psalm 41, which was read out to us today, says this. It says it really clearly. In my integrity, he's talking to God. In my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. In my integrity, you uphold me and you set me in your presence forever. The psalmist, the psalm of David, had understood that even though he had blown it, he could get right with God and he could have integrity because of that. Because David had blown it pretty badly. See, for David, life had become very explosive at one point. And yet he realized that he could have a life of integrity. He didn't need to hang out with the party animals. And that's meant to have it around the other way. If you read it carefully, you'll see on his t-shirt, right forever. But we're not right forever unless we get it right at the beginning. You see. We think we can hide things. We think we can put God aside in some way at times. And maybe even think we can put him aside in even greater detail. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we will stand and fall by who we are. And if we are living with masks, if we are two-faced, if we are people lacking integrity, we will have to stand and be accounted. <laughs> this is the dance we had this morning. It says, I want more from living than just living for today. One more of sacrifice than just tithing to a plate. I want to be more than healthy, more than wealthy, more than wise. I want to see the hunger in the third world's eyes. And I write it off and wrap it up in a Christian 
talking guys, don't let me become the man that I say that I despise. I want to ask you this question in conclusion this morning. Do you value integrity? And don't tell me you do. Unless you're willing to do something about it. You see, we talked about the whole business that was going to deal with role models. You see, what are we? A role model for heaven or a role model for hell? Everybody, everybody has a responsibility here in this room. God wants us to realize that. And even if you have difficulty struggling with God, or even believing in God, I'd like to ask you this this morning. Have you kept your integrity? Are you keeping your integrity? Do you value your integrity enough to give God the opportunity to deal with stuff? And I don't particularly mind who it is who hears this this morning. Some of you may be claiming to be Christians. If you're lacking integrity, I can tell you that Psalm 41 it makes it very clear that to get into God's eternity, we have to have integrity. Integrity of hearing what He says and doing what He says. The integrity of living the way that He wanted us and designed us to live. He loved us enough to want us to have the best. So I'd like to invite you to pray with me, to talk to God this morning. And maybe even give Him a shot that you've never given Him before. Give them a chance to deal with the issues that may be in your life. Whether it be struggling with issues of integrity or whether it be struggling with even God himself. Let's do that. Let's talk to him together. God, for some of us it's here in this room today, it's, it's even hard to talk to you because we're not even sure about you. For some of us here today, we, we're sure about you, but we haven't really been doing what you have wanted us to do. And Lord, for others of us, we have been trying to work it all out. And, and we also want to acknowledge that we need your help. And we are truly coming to you this morning to say that we're sorry for the times when we have blown, when we have not done what you have asked us to do. And we would like to know the measure of your peace and your love and your joy that we've never known before. We would like to be able to walk in uprightness, honesty, sincerity. We'd like to walk in a way that would cause others to be able to say, there goes a woman or a man who stands head and shoulders above others. Not because of our height, but because of the heights to which you take us. And so Lord, we'd ask you and invite you to, to work in our lives and to bring change in our lives and to bring change wherever we go. So lead us in your love and your power, we would pray. Help us. Help us to have the, the strength of mind and character to be able to own you as Lord and Saviour. And they all said, Amen. And the, all the people said, Amen. You know, I really pray that this will have high impact. And I'm not just saying this to our visitors. I'm glad you came here this morning, those who have visited and have come here or started coming here. I'm glad you came. I really pray that every person here you knows there's lots of stuff that we've got to deal with as individuals in terms of integrity. Amen? Amen. May the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful day. We're going to have a celebration time tonight. But let's give a real appreciation to all those who work in the kitchen, the back room.